Good morning, Al. Dan, I you know, watched your show morph through the years. It's been great. You know, years ago, I would you know call in and we'd be talking about gap control and maybe man to man outside zone underneath. And now I wake up this morning and you're cooking a lot of meat and you're talking about Jeff Bezos' divorce. Very, very eclectic. I'm so proud of you. Just a well-rounded man that I am. But you wouldn't be into our Meat Friday on Meat Wednesday today because we have hot dogs and we have chicken. And When's the last time you had a hot dog? Yesterday. No, I think it was maybe, maybe Monday. No, they have hot dogs at the, at the club, at the golf club. Okay. Which are very, very good. Chicken, I, I like chicken, too. Remember, it's just, it's just vegetables. It's vegetables and it's mushrooms and it's onions that are verboten. Everything else is, uh, you know, fish is good. Fruit okay. is great. Steak is terrific. You know, that wonderful steak we had from Toscana when I uh, visited the studio in Los Angeles. We'll do that again. I hope we can re- reprise that uh, hopefully in the next couple of months. Do you cook? So, you know, I'm, I'm well-rounded. Do you cook? Do I cook? I used to barbecue. I would throw a steak on the barbecue. That's about as far as I would go. But my wife would have to brush it. And she'd put a, uh, a potato in the, uh, in the oven, and that's about as far as we would. In fact, we may even do that tonight. Uh, all right, let me start with the important stuff. The Chris Collinsworth slide into the frame, into the picture, to start the broadcast. Uh, when did this become a phenomenon? I think about maybe a month or six weeks ago, and somebody brought it up to me, and then more and more people brought it up, and I guess it became a big deal, you know, on social media and the Internet and all of that. Uh, I was not aware of it, you know, by going to the Internet, but people were telling me about it. Then I had to go and see what it was about. And so we decided we would have a little bit of fun. Uh, I think it was the game in Los Angeles. It was uh, the Eagles and the Rams week 13 or 14, uh, out here at the Coliseum, and we figured out, you know what, let's, uh, let's have a little fun with this. We'll acknowledge it. So we even thought at one point what I would do is I would turn to my left, and then Chris would sneak in from the right, and I'd turn around as if I was surprised, but that was overdoing it. So all we did was bring him in from the right side, just <laughs> let the folks out there know, hey, we're with you. We get what's going on. We're all in this together. Let's have a lot of fun. But I didn't know if, if he was sliding in or your camera was just widening out, so it gave the appearance that Chris was sliding in. Or is it a combo? It's a combo platter. Okay. Because you know most of those booths that we do the, the on-cameras from are very small. They're very, very tight. And Chris you know, really has to sit next to me, but to get out of the initial shot when I'm coming on and you know, laying out the groundwork for the game and what you know, the, the big stories are, and then bring Chris in for the analysis. So what he has to do... Is, is lean out at about a, you know, maybe a 45 to 55 degree angle. So his, his <laughs> torso is closer to mine, not on camera, but the shoulders and the head are, you know, at a 45 degree angle to the outside. And then he kind of comes, he comes uh, angling in, let's put it that way. How often do you, do you bite your tongue on saying something critical about the officials? Uh, a lot. You know, the one thing about the officials... This is a very hard game to officiate. I mean, it's really, it's insane to think that a, an official can see everything. You've got 22 fairly massive bodies colliding on every play, and these guys are supposed to, you know, detect every single move, move and, and, and get it right the first time. And the only time I really get frustrated is when the, the announcements don't tell you what happened. And I guess that was, you know, my frustration from time to time, you know, through the years. Hey, what happened? We're trying to figure this out. We kind of know the rule book. We now have Terry McCauley in there as well. Thank God, who, you know, longtime official uh, to kind of be a parse through, through everything. And you just want to know at the end of the play, uh, what was the deal? What, what's, what is the rule? What, tell me what the rule is. And, you know, through the years, uh, we found a lot of, you know, a lot of officials are, are good, some are much better than others, but you know I do understand uh, that this is a t- this is the toughest game to officiate by far. So you know you want to give them as much leeway as you can, but you do want to know at the end of the day, at the end of the play, what what's the call? What, tell me tell me what the rule is and why you've interpreted it the way you have. 
Living in Los Angeles, can you explain to us why Los Angeles has embraced the Rams far more than the Chargers? Well, the Rams were here uh, for a number of years, and most of the people that, you know, that I grew up with around here when I went to high school, and the, the Rams were here, and the Chargers had started here, but in the American Football League, which nobody was really paying a lot of attention to in 1960, they were here one year, and then they went to San Diego. So they were never Los Angeles' team. They were San Diego's team between 61 and, and a couple of years ago. The Rams were part of the, uh, the fabric here. And we even showed it on the game this year, Dan, where, you know, I, the first time I ever went to the Coliseum, you go back to 1958, I'm just a kid, I had just moved out here, they're playing the Chicago Bears, the crowd was 100,000, comma, 470. 100,000, 470, great game, Rams won 41-35. Southern California is 40% larger now than it was then. So when people say, oh, you know, can the Rams fill the stadium, I'm going, Wait a minute. If you draw 100,000 in 1958, <laughs> can't get 75,000? I don't understand the math. So that's why the Rams, you know, and the Rams got back here first. You know, they had a, a year head start on the Chargers. The Rams are playing in, the, in, a, in an iconic stadium, even though it's under you know, construction right now. It doesn't look very good at the moment. Uh, and the Chargers are playing in a soccer stadium, which holds about 28 or 29,000 people. So that is why, you know, the Rams, it, it's kind of like Lakers, Clippers, it's sort of like, you know, Dodgers, Angels, it's Kings against the Ducks. The other teams may have some success, but still, I mean, it's, going, it's always going to be the Dodgers. It's always going to be the Lakers, always. And, I mean, it's like Chicago, too. You look at Chicago. The, the, the fact is, the people forget. Everybody remembers the Cubs winning the World Series a couple of years ago. Wow, you know, it's 18 million years since they won it. The White Sox won it. Yeah. About 12 years ago, does anybody talk about the fact the White Sox won it? So it's like Chicago, too. It's always going to be Cubs 1, White Sox 2. Same thing out here. It'll always be Rams 1, Chargers 2. But the Chargers are making some inroads right now. They win on Sunday. All of a sudden, there'll be a lot of buzz around here. You have the game on Saturday between the, the Chiefs and the Colts. And you have two marquee quarterbacks here. Obviously, you know Andrew Luck being back. But it, is there a subplot that you're looking to emerge here or preparing for it to emerge in this game? I think one of the most interesting matchups is going to be that Colt defense, which has gotten so much better. This Darius Leonard is, is something. He's the, the linebacker, should win defensive rookie of the year. We have Kenny Moore on the back end. They've got some good players. Uh, we saw them against Tennessee. Watch them now evolve. Uh, you've got Luck playing great. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, nobody knew if Andrew Luck could throw a football. And he started out fairly slowly, and they were 1-5, and five, and they lost to the Jets, and they looked terrible. And they got the offense together, and Marlon Mack has turned into a, you know, a really good running back, and we know about T.Y. Hilton. He's been there for years. But on the other side of the ball, I think they've done a tremendous job. And Matt Eberflus you know, may get a head coaching job at some point because of the job he has done as the defensive coordinator. So I see in the Colts, I mean, it's pretty. It's it's a, an amazing story in many ways. A lot of credit goes to Chris Ballard, the general manager. Uh, I mean, he took some, some chances in the draft. He built that offensive line that Quentin Nelson is a monster. I mean, and I said it on the air when we had the Tennessee game. You pick a guard, yeah. number one. Nobody's too excited about it. Because <laughs> the, an offensive guard is the least glamorous position in football. The fans want you to draft, you know, a running back. If you need a quarterback, obviously a quarterback, a deep, somebody. You know, a Joey Bosa, maybe, somebody like that, a pass rusher. Nobody's going to get excited about a guard, but you, you isolate this guy on tape and everything. Wow. And they've done, I think Ballard's done a fantastic job. The best thing that happened to them, of course, is Andrew Luck, you know, doing what he's doing. But I think, you know, that we know about what the Chiefs' offense is. It's great. It, they can, you know, run up 60 points. But that Indy defense is much better right now than it's been, and I think that's going to be a heck of a matchup. What's the most surprising game that you've ever called with the outcome of you didn't see that happening? Oh, man, uh, there's so many of them. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I'm going, I was just thinking about the, uh, believe it or not, the Rams-Titans Super Bowl back after the 99 season. And it wasn't, the first half was pretty boring. I think it was 9 nothing. Rams then took a 16 nothing lead. It looks like the game was over. And uh, Jeff Fisher rallied the troops on the sideline, the Tennessee, the uh, Titans coach at that point, tied the game with two minutes to go. So, wow, 
you know, here we are, and then Isaac Bruce caught a, a touchdown pass right after the two-minute warning from Kurt Warner. That was the year that the Rams came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden the greatest show on turf evolved from a 4-12 and season. And you had Warner and Falk and, you know, Isaac Bruce and Torrey Holt and all of that. And then the Titans came back and, and, and got it all the way down the field, and the game ended on the one-yard line with a great tackle by Mike Jones on Kevin Dyson. So, I mean, that, that was game. I wouldn't say that was the most surprising game. It was, it was as exciting as any game I can remember. And, and just to have it evolve that way and end that way, you know, it's so funny, Damon. You're always thinking about the wackiest things, you know, yeah. the, are the most recent. And there were a few wackier th- games than we, we did in Chicago the other day. I mean, what can I tell you? Everybody saw it. Everybody's talking about it. You know, Chris uh, summed it up perfectly, the double doink uh, ending the game. So, you know, through the years, I've done so many. I've done, I think, about 800 NFL games now, counting, you know, pre- and postseason and all of that. So some of them run together, but, uh, you know, you remember the fantastic endings. Who's done more NFL games than you? Uh, I don't think anybody, probably, because I've done this for 33 years. 33 seasons, started in 86 on Monday night, went over to NBC in, in 06. So we've done about, I don't know, 20-some-odd games a year, plus playoffs, plus... So I think I'm, I'm in the 700s for sure <laughs> at that point. I don't know. I don't, I don't think... I, I don't know that anybody's done any more. Maybe... I know Pat Summerall yeah. had a long career. Frank Gifford did it for 27 years, so Frank, you know, several hundred. But uh, I can't think of anybody who's done it for 33 well, hopefully uh, you continue doing it a long time there, Hal. I don't know. It, 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 you know, we, we don't do this with broadcasters like we do with athletes. Like, you know, we're, we, we keep trying to push Brady out the door, it seems like. You know, like you get to a certain age where you're like, ah, it's time for you to retire. Yeah. Thankfully, we don't do that to us. I hope. I hope you don't. Come on. Now, I, you know what? I, I got to tell you something. I, I love it as much as I ever have, maybe more. Because I know, you know, I'm closer to the end of the career than the beginning. I get that. But I draw such inspiration from people like Vin Scully. You know, Vinny was 88, and he was still great. My man Marv Albert still going strong. Brent Musburger. You look at these guys. Dick Enberg yeah. did it for a long time. And I think I told you once, I went to a Bruce Springsteen concert a couple of years ago. I'd never seen him. And he's running around the stage for three hours and 40 minutes. Doesn't take a break. Gets crowd surfed. He's all over the place, <laughs> playing the hell out of every song. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm walking out of the sports arena that night going, you know what? This guy just did this for three hours and 40 minutes at the age of whatever he was at that point, 66 or 67. He's done this. He's going to do it again in two nights. Then he's going to do it again in two more nights. I think I can do a few, few football games. I really do after watching Springsteen. So I draw my inspiration from that. Yeah, you're just sitting there in a comfy seat talking. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not too demanding. Right, people screaming at you. In the, nah, I've got, I've got the, yeah, you know, Mike, too. i got the great, greatest you food. And, you know, it's adrenalizing, Dan, because it's exciting, and you're doing stuff on the fly, and it's all live. And You know, the greatest thing about this job, there's no second take. So once in a while, you're going to say something you wish you could, you know, pull back. I get it. I mean, you know, you can't dispense 18 gazillion words and not have a few thumps. And I've had them in my career. I get it. But it, it's so adrenalizing to be there and to think, you know, hey, you got to be so sharp, razor sharp. And I don't know, the, those three hours, the synapses of my brain open up very wide. <laughs> and then at the end of the game, I go back to going, uh, you know, who's my next door neighbor? Have fun in uh, Kansas City, Al. Thanks for joining us as always. Safe travels. You too, Dan. Take care, Thank buddy. you, bud. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV or download the Dan Patrick Show app.